The very first tape recorders that you could get when I was a kid were about the size of a lunchbox. Yeah. And you had to press both play and record at the same time in order to get them to record anything. And the condenser mic was really nothing more than three little lines flush with the body of the cassette recorder. And if you blew into it like this, and then played it back, it made a sound like this. This led to lots of skits about nuclear holocaust and the end of the world and what does this button do? And if you blew into the mic three times fast, like it sounded like this. And this led to lots of film noir skits and cowboy and Indian Indian skits and I bet you knew it was gonna end like this. And army skits, and it was an army skit that I was recording with my brother when I was 11 and he was 8 that I said the dirtiest thing I have ever said. It wasn't the kind of thing that I thought was appropriate for an 11 year old boy and his 8 year old brother. It was, I still maintain to this day, simply the kind of thing that I thought a tough battle-worn soldier would say, especially if he were under a lot of pressure to <coughs> hold his position, which Jim, the character I was playing in the skit, most certainly was. <coughs> Jim, can you hold your position? The captain asked. I was also the captain. And what I said was, what I made Jim say when he was asked by the captain if he could hold his position was this. Oh, I'll hold my position all right, Captain. Just as sure as a man fucks his, his, his dick. <laughs> that was the toughest, machoest thing that I could think that a soldier would say. Oh, I'll hold my position all right, Captain. Just as sure as a man fucks his dick. <clears throat> Now, if I could go back in time, I would have the captain ask Jim a few follow-up questions, like, Jim, is that yes or no? Or maybe, Jim, are you gay? Because it's totally okay if you are. Or maybe even, Jim, how does a man fuck his own dick? We've been talking about it at headquarters. We're not even sure it's anatomically possible. But I think that may have been the day. That may have been the moment. That may have been the single line that made me realize I could become a poet. Because my brother looked at me with wide-eyed conspiratorial wonder and said, where did you come up with that? That is pure genius. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here. Um, I have made new friends and seen old friends, and uh, I was struck by that uh, the young woman who came, who read here for the first time just last, and the same line that, that struck you struck me, except I think it was, it's not pen and paper are my medicine, it's ink and paper, because there's a tattoo uh, <laughs> reference in there that, uh, I don't know why you missed that with all of that. <laughs> Speaking about things you missed, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read that poem you mentioned that you didn't realize was a Sestina. It's called, as many Sestinas are, Sestina. <laughs> what I was trying to do with this, the, the thing I hate about Sestinas is that everybody who gets up to read them says, I'm gonna read a Sestina now which is a six stanza poem of six lines that end with the same six words. And the six words that I have chosen are as if we're not gonna hear them six times already, we'll know what they are. But if you're really doing your job with a Sestina, Sestina ends with a three line stanza called what? The envoi, the envoi. And the envoi has to use all six words that you used to end the six line stanzas now in half the space. And so when I wrote this poem, I thought, what if, what if the six words were by themselves a sentence? 
so that when I got to the envoi, all I had to do was say those six words in a certain order, and it would be grammatically correct. And so that's what I chose to do with this. So I'm not going to tell you what the words are, because you're going to hear them seven times. Figure it out. Sestina. All, all of these poems are about the death of my first wife, Rebecca Tauber Molly. She took her own life uh, 14 years ago. And uh, who was it who said that uh, ink and paper are your medicine, right? This is, this is part of how I heal as well. So as, as hard as these poems may have been to read and make you cry, it would have been so much worse if I didn't have this outlet. So give it up for outlets like poetry and readings where you can come and share. Sestina. Like many children of Holocaust survivors, she battled depression, cried a lot, and was a lover of loners and underdogs, not given to letting the world, hers or mine, help her shed what she wanted to, weight, dead weight, the dead, or even save what little she wanted to save. She used to cry as if she had no will or way to stop what the bloodied knot of her heart was doing to her life, not to mention ours or mine. Still, we married, and for a while it was not hell. We lived not happily, but well, not without laughter and desire, save for the times that she tried to mine our marriage for some deadlier fire. She was afflicted and distraught, was, in retrospect, a little too in love with dying things to fully live or live fully, not that there is much difference or was. Everything is different now, save that for 10 years time she was mine to have and to hold in sickness and in health, mine to love until death do us part. I have two confessions. I knew she was not all right and I was not her knight or savior. Still, I tried to save her because everything about her was beautifully sad and broken. And what I believed was this. She needed only love, mine. That alone would be enough to save Rebecca from Rebecca. But to be fair, there was something I did not understand so well as she. She was not mine to save. When Philip booked me for this, thank you. When Philip booked me for this feature, he said, oh, I hope you'll read lots of poems from The Wedding Stone. I can only do one, uh, or, or else we'll, I'll, I'll be crying, and you will probably too. I am um, I do. I do have copies of these. They're, they're uh, seven bucks, but there's a special deal that I'll tell you about in a moment. <laughs> I'm particularly lucky that I've got uh, one poem that gets read by a lot of teachers. I have one poem that's been read at over a thousand weddings, and I have a new poem that is very popular at funerals. <laughs> and uh, so all I need now are, um, you know, bar mitzvahs and uh, birthdays. birthdays. Bris was the word I was coming, trying to come up with. And uh, here's the poem that gets read at a lot of funerals and it has been recently uh, printed by a letterpress, uh, all women, a women-owned letterpress shop in, in Brooklyn, and uh, it's called My Deepest Condiments. <laughs> I tend to write a lot of poems about, shut up. I tend to write a lot of poems about, uh, acci about reaching for the right word accidentally landing on the wrong word, and then, in retrospect, realizing that the wrong word was, in fact, the perfect word. This is, a, this is a perfect example of that. My deepest condiments. I send you my deepest condiments was in no way what my old friend meant to say, or write, or send, the night she penned a note to me one week after my father died. Not condolences or sentiments instead. No, she sent me her deepest condiments. As if the dead have need of relish, mustard, or ketchup on the other side. And there's a nice little graphic of a little relish tray, Victorian relish tray. 
And oh, how that word made me laugh so hard out loud it hurt, so wonderfully absurd, and such a sweet relief at a time when it seemed that only grief was allowed in after my father's death. Sweet and simple laughter, which is nothing more than breath, brought up from so far deep inside so many years, it often brings up with it tears. And so I laughed and I laughed until my sides were sore. And later, I think I may have even cried a little more. So these, I have yet to uh, sell a single one of these. They arrived uh, earlier this week. Tonight is the first time that these letterpress uh, poems are going to be available, and they will be, if you want just this poem, they will be $5, but there is a special deal coming up. That I'll <laughs> I've been teaching some kind of poetry workshop all over the world to all kinds of students for almost 20 years. This is not a poem, this is just me talking. I'm told that it's sometimes hard to tell when I'm in the middle of doing one thing and when I'm in the middle of doing the other, but I often teach poetry workshops to uh, people who don't want to be there. I'm the visiting poet from New York, and here I am, and I have to deal with poets who, people who just sit there like, I am a math person. I didn't want to take this workshop. I was told I had to. And I was confronted with a young woman, a, young, a girl, who called herself a math science student, and I said, well, that's okay. And then I heard myself saying, a metaphor is really just an equation between two nouns. And her eyes got wide and said, equation? You're speaking my language. And I said, no, it's true. A metaphor is a way of saying this, let this equal that. Let, at least for the purposes of this poem, my mother be equal to a broken wine glass. She's obviously not literally a broken wine glass, but for the sake of this poem, let us say that she is a broken wine glass. Look at the following metaphors. Uh, my, my father was a gentle rain. Love is a happy blessing. Uh, your face is a backhanded compliment. And uh, they these are all saying these are all saying this big concept is equal to this small object with perhaps this adjective in the middle thrown in. And then I said, and now I was just showing off to the kid, I said, in fact, if you're ever stuck writing a poem, one way to get started is to just generate a bunch of lot of metaphor, a bunch of lotta. I need another beer from the birthday girl when I come off stage. IPA if I could have one when I'm coming off. Uh, a bunch of lot of, just generate a bunch of lot of metaphors and then see which ones seem interesting to you and worthy of a lot of exploration, a, a lot of, a bunch of lot of expo exploration. And it suddenly occurred to me, if that is such a good idea, how come nobody has invented some way of just generating lots of metaphors? Well, <laughs> now they have, and it's called Metaphor Dice. Actually, uh, this is going live in April. These are not on the market yet, but I am marketing Metaphor Dice. It is 12 die. We were going to call it Metaphor Die, but we didn't, but we didn't. So it's 12 dice, uh, four red concepts, 24 total red concepts, 24 blue objects, and 24 adjectives, you roll them, you pick one of each color, color, you arrange them red, white, and blue, because this is Donald Trump's America, and then you read it. The ones I have here are my birth. My birth was a small town prayer. He, every one of these, I came up with all the most of the words, and every one of these makes me want to go write a journal entry, right? Um, my father, my father was a, was a, uh, my father was a, Small town is showing up twice. My father was a bright superhero. Loving you, loving you is a desperate prayer. Loving you is a desperate kiss. That poem is practically writing itself. <laughs> anyway, here's the special deal. I put together, for, just for this night, one minute, then this will be my final poem. My final poem is a, is a pitch. Is a pitch for you to buy something because this is Donald Trump's America. I put together these goodie bags. You would, um, for $15, get one copy of uh, The Wedding Stone, uh, one copy of The Broadside, uh, My Deepest Condiments, one copy of my 
most famous poem, uh, What Teachers Make, on a little on a little pull-out screen like that. So you get to see what I look like before I sold my hair to the American Cancer Society. You get a, um, a sticker that says, uh, this is a like-free zone. You get a digital drink coaster from 2002, um, which if you have a CD player, also doubles as a CD. And then you get a prototype set of metaphor dice. See me at the bar. Thank you so much. Have a great night.